Welcome. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I'm Christian Sandvig, and I'm here with Charlton McElwain, and we're going to be discussing Smash the Mainframe, the collision between civil rights and computing. I just wanted to start and mention that today's program is sponsored by the School of Information, and uh, we'd like to thank the support we received from the William Warner Bishop Lectureship Fund and the Martha Boas Fund. Um, this talk is presented in partnership with the Center for Ethics, Society, and Computing. And I, as I said, I'm Christian Sandvig. I'm um, the H. Marshall McLuhan Collegiate Professor in the School of Information and the Department of Communication and Media here at the University of Michigan. And I'm also the director of the Center for Ethics, Society, and Computing. And I'm delighted, I'm so happy to be here with um, Charlton McElwain, who I will introduce as he smiles at me from his little box. Um, Charlton is in New York City where the weather is worse than Ann Arbor for once. That may not have happened before ever. Um, it, he's uh, more seriously, uh, Charlton is a, a professor at NYU where he's been since 2001. He's the vice provost for faculty engagement and development. Uh, and he's also uh, a professor in the media communicate, excuse me, media culture and communication program. Uh, that's at the Steinhardt School. And um, Charlton scholarly work focuses on the intersection of race, digital media, and racial justice activism, which is squarely our topic today. Um, he founded the Center for Critical Race and Digital Studies, which I recommend to you highly. Uh, he is the author of the new book that we'll be discussing, Black Software, colon, The Internet and Racial Justice from Afronet to Black Lives Matter, which was uh, from Oxford University Press. Um, Charlton recently testified before the U.S. House Financial Affairs Committee about the impact of automation and artificial intelligence in the financial services sector, and I think we're going to get to that today as well. And he writes regularly about issues of race, technology, and public policy for venues like um, The Guardian, the MIT Technology Review, Slate, Future Tense, and other outlets. Uh, I'm so delighted to have such a distinguished guest that I get to talk to for an hour, and he'll even answer your questions a little later. Um, Charlton's current book is our topic today, but I also wanted to mention he previously wrote an award-winning uh, earlier book called Race Appeal, How Political Candidates Invoke Race in U.S. Political Campaigns. Um, he, my, my last comment about his extremely distinguished and long CV that I'll convey is that he uh, received his PhD uh, in communication uh, and a master's degree in human relations from the University of Oklahoma, and he uh, is a graduate with his BA from Oklahoma Baptist University. Uh, so Charlton, that was a long time of me talking. So let me say, hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Looking forward to this. It's going to be great. So uh, I thought we could just start out with uh, just launching right into it. I just want to get right to it. What about the title of this talk? So the title uh, of the talk is Smashing the Mainframe. And I think, you know, as someone who's really interested in computers, um, it might not be obvious, like to me as a younger person, I did not see an obvious connection between um, say protests in the 1960s and computing technology. But I read that computers were the targets of protesters. So what is, I has smashed the mainframe. What is, how does, what's the connection between computing and, and how it was viewed then? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, you know, it's uh, one of those things that was uh, uh, a discovery, if you will, of mine as I was writing and researching uh, this book. And we'll come back to a lot of the uh, sort of the big part, picture parts of this, which was the sort of the clash between civil rights and computing throughout the 60s, which is a story that I think few of us have ever uh, really heard or thought about. Uh, but it was one of these moments, uh, in fact, several moments throughout the 1960s where this really came to the fore. And uh, it first came to my attention because of an incident that happened here at uh, the university where I am at NYU in 1970. Um, but a similar instance uh, a couple of years before in 1968, uh, 
um, which was the first time this really happened on the campus of UCSB uh, at the height of the civil rights movement and a lot of the protests that were happening. Um, and so black students on campus wanted some things. They were demanding some things and they wanted to protest. And so uh, in the same sort of uh, mode of the sit-ins and then more uh, lively, if you will, types of protest, these students looked around and said, what can we occupy? Where can we basically uh, identify and seize power and some sense of control over the university to get what we want, to make it known what we want and to demand something? And those students chose the computer lab. Uh, and they called uh, North Hall, I think it was at the time, uh, housed a giant mainframe computer. I think all the mainframes, of course, were giant in those days. Um, but it was housed in that, uh, in that particular area building of the university. And that's what they occupied along with threats. And what uh, I thought was sort of humorous, or at least humorous looking back on the time was uh, these kids didn't have a clue really about computers. They weren't computer scientists. They weren't computing students. Uh, they didn't seem to have any real sense of what that machine was, but they knew something about it. They knew that it was uh, symbolic of the power that the institution held. They could see its investment in this machine uh, that they were pouring so much of their hopes and dreams in. And so they occupied North Hall. And they basically said, look, we got your mechanical brain. We want justice. I mean, it, would you say, let me, let me ask you a question here about this. Did, as a child of the 70s and 80s, I feel like computing at that time was seen as a great thing. It was like, hey, computers are so great. They're like tools for making money or something. And then in the 90s, it's the internet and we're all going to be able to do everything. Um, and so what I learned from your book is this earlier era, like the 60s, when if you wanted to think of computers, you might think of oppression and government control. Do you think that this is also the era we're in now? Because it seems like computers have a pretty bad reputation at the moment. Yeah, there are a lot of parallels between the beginning and where we're at in this present moment. And I think it all comes back to that idea about power. So in the 1960s, when you know virtually no one really knew about these things and your average person wasn't thinking about what this new machine was, much less its potential um, to make their lives better, they did have a keen sense that um, there was some aspect of institutional power that was embodied in that machine and the locations that, uh, that housed them. Um, and it was a grapple for power and the realization that, hey, we need justice, we want justice, we demand justice, and this computer, this machine is a symbol of what stands between me and the power that I don't have, the justice that I want and demand. You know, I think the thing that, um, you know, is a little bit different about today than 50 years ago is that we can, of course, see all the ways in which uh, not only is the computer symbolic of power, but the ways in which the computer has become a very, very real oppressive force on uh, on our lives and pe particularly people of color's lives. I mean, there's some amazing stuff in the book relating to, for example, the early history of the IBM Corporation and the way that it was used to support uh, the process of apartheid and, um, you know, how it was proposed to solve the race problem in the Watts riots. Uh, I mean, so fascinating stuff. But I, I feel like just to be kind to the audience, I want to underline again this sort of cool thing about this history is that it, it shows us um, how strange the 60s were. And we get to think about the 60s in a way that, you know, is probably different than today. Because I, I, so... The reason I say that is I pulled out this headline from the book, um, and this is a headline from the Detroit um, Tribune from 1965 that you wrote about. And uh, the headline is, Head-On Collision Course for Civil Rights 
and automation. So in the headline, it's natural that civil rights and computers are big, important forces in society that are opposed. And I think maybe before this talk, some of the audience would not have necessarily thought about this connection. So could you tell us a little bit about this or the headline or really yeah, whatever you that, want? That's, that's a precisely um, the point uh, that I make is that when we think about computing history, when we think about the history of civil rights, we don't generally think about those two things um, overlapping with, with, with one another. Um, in fact, uh, what we do have or we previously had about the tie-in between civil rights and computing in the 1960s uh, was from a great piece uh, by Tara McPherson uh, some years ago that talked about uh, a kind of a lenticular logic that underpinned these two things that were going on simultaneously, the civil rights movement on one hand, the computer revolution on the other. Uh, but they were presented as two things happening on parallel tracks sharing this uh, sort of logic, but there wasn't a sense that these two things were intertwined. And then uh, it was when I hit the 60s, this was one of those headlines that I fixated on because it was quite the opposite to think about this headline in, um, this actually preceded, this, this came from a newsletter uh, by Labor, uh, Labor Department Secretary Willard Wirtz, um, and it came in a newsletter that came on Monday before the Voting Rights Act was signed on that Thursday. Um, and so here you have it at the beginning of this week, um, this bombshell that really says, look, we are in the middle. We don't even really know what this era, new era of automation and computing, uh, how it's gonna unfold, what it's gonna look like. But we do know that it's gonna revolutionize society in some way, and we recognize that these two things, civil rights and automation, are not on parallel tracks. They're on a dead collision course for each other. And so there was a sense in which people knew at the time that these two things were in many ways opposing forces. Um, those who were in government knew and recognized that. Those in the labor community, the civil rights community, knew about that and there was this question and there was this consternation about what will happen to black folks, those who don't have power, those who aren't represented in these institutions that are building these new machines, that are controlling how we're gonna use them, um, how will we be impacted? And particularly for folks like A. Philip Randolph um, and others that were uh, really, really focused on how are Black folks going to uh, make a living, find jobs, uh, et cetera, when the computer comes on as a new technology, um, what is its impact going to be on Black folks? Because they had a keen sense of reality, right? These were not folks that uh, were hanging out at I MIT or at Stanford or UCLA uh, as people were thinking about network computers uh, as this uh, thing about um, IBM and IBM's position in the computer uh, world uh, and industry uh, was taking an outsized uh, influence. But they knew something about the history of Black people, about the history of race, about the history of racial oppression. And so they knew that no matter what the technology, um, Black people were going to be left behind. Uh, that no matter what the particular tool would be, and it's interesting in this particular article um, by Works, uh, he starts to talk about, you know, what he calls learning machines, what we would probably now refer to as AI. And he basically says, look, the machines we have now in 1968 are far beyond basically what most Black people are able to do and learn. And so what is that going to mean about uh, black people's ability to keep pace in an economy and the labor market when our machines are already uh, one step ahead and threatening to be even even more. So that that totally clears up my understanding of some of the interesting connections you draw in your book because it seems like there's like three parts of that answer. Like you first talked about this idea that it's about control and what we used to call data processing and the state and government. 
surveillance. And then you talked about how it was about jobs, you know, which we worry about a lot today uh, mm -hmm. with automation. Uh, but then you, the, the third part, um, wait, I just forgot. What was the third part? You just said it. Uh, <laughs> I forgot what you just said it. I swear. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. AI, there was jobs, there was race, there was labor. Well, labor. I can't remember. But yeah. anyway, I think I think the third part was probably some part of the second part. But the the thing I the thing I sort of that that helped me with is um when I think about your book uh and the arguments in it, like I think one of the beautiful things is the way that you've written a book that spans so much such a large time period. I mean it starts out, you know, it starts out with uh, very recent events like the Black Lives Matter movement, and it connects to that, and and so we see this dualism of, you know, I don't know, 1965, 2016, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like they seem in in parallel. Uh, and um, so I wonder if you could say something about sort of the big picture, like the book. You know, what were you? What was your goal? Or you know, what? Why did you decide to write it in this structure? Or Make, it makes it very relevant, so I'm excited by the structure. Indeed, indeed, and um, you know, cut me off if I go too long because it's a big story. In part because I started at a particular point, and 
Great. So sorry about that. It looks like we had a technical problem, uh, but we're back now. We yeah, hope. Back. And uh, uh, where we were cut off, we were just inviting Charlton to talk about uh, his story behind the book. Yes, indeed. So, th I mean, this started very simply. I wanted to understand Black Lives Matter um, and I wanted to understand where it came from. So here you had this movement um, that emerged that was powerful. Its impact was um, amazing. In fact, you know, it did something that uh, we hadn't managed to do in more than 50 years, which is to catapult uh, the issue of race and racial justice, and particularly um, issues of racial justice in the criminal justice system onto the public agenda for a sustained period of time. And so if there was no other outcome of Black Lives Matter, that one thing spoke volume, something that we had not managed to do decade after decade after decade since the civil rights movement. So I wanna understand uh, where that came from knowing that you know, movements like these don't emerge from nowhere. But I was also really focused in on the technology piece because I could also see that the technological underpinnings, the ways in which Black Lives Matter mobilized social media side and other features of the web was also peculiar and told me that there was something there. This wasn't, you know, a lot of people just saying, all right, let me get on Twitter and make this movement happen. That's, this came from somewhere. So Black Software, when it first began, started as what is the, uh, uh, the sort of generational um, uh, beginnings of the Black Lives Matter movement. And I thought to myself, this is a fairly short historical story um, that has to begin and end um, no further back than let's say the mid 1990s with the dawn of the web and, and so forth. And so that's where I started uh, to look. And everything uh, from there uh, just went out the window. Um, as I began to meet people, as I began to talk to people, um, this sense of much more of a historical window um, such that my question became altogether different, which was less about how did Black Lives Matter happen and more about what's been the long relationship between Black people and technology over a much longer historical trajectory. And part of that for me in the ending up, you know, back in the 80s and then to the 70s, ultimately back in the 60s, in part was for a way for me to try to understand something else that I uh, sort of stumbled on, which is when I went back to the 90s, uh, finding all of these uh, folks, black folks who were so pivotal, pivotal and central uh, to the internet's birth, its beginnings, its early development. Um, there was uh, once, uh, a chapter in an early version of the book that I titled, Remember When the Internet Was Black. And it had everything to do with this moment in the 90s where you had black uh, hobbyists and entrepreneurs and some engineers and scientists, but mostly teachers and cops and firefighters who were part of this network computer system, building, building communities, uh, interacting with, with each other um, and making money. Uh, making money in the 94, 95, 96 early internet era. And by the end of the 90s, all of that particular piece of it, the part that had to do with the entrepreneurs who profited from these ventures all came to a grinding halt. And so for me, a new question became what explains that sudden um, and abrupt change where you're net noirs and your uh, um, things like that, those uh, portals, those communities that were on uh, AOL that made the world a lot of, uh, made AOL a lot of money, uh, that really brought a lot of people, Black people, uh, all kinds of people to this new web at a time when people really didn't know what this thing was for. Um, why did all of that suddenly and abruptly come to an end? And Before you answer, I just want to emphasize that as a reader, 
you know, this is such a great part of the book because I feel like about every seven pages, you get a new black organization that you've never heard of before, even if you're really into computers. And so it's like Afronet, I guess I should say, even if you're really into computers and you're white and you're, you know, not old enough to remember the 1990s, right? So, but it's like Afronet and inner city software and like Black Geeks Online and like every few pages in this book, there's these other, these organizations and it just gives you this picture that you think if you're, you know, if you're used to the received history of the internet and computers, you're just wondering like, what, why is the received history so different? I, I, you know, why is this so different than, you know, what I've been taught about where things came from? So, so sorry, I just wanted to like excitedly agree with you, but now you should say, you should solve the puzzle. Why did they all go away in the nineties? Why did they go? They all go away. There, I mean, there are <clears throat> there there are a couple of reasons. I think the immediate reason is um, uh, the lack of capital that really propelled these ventures in the first place. And so that's one reason. Simply that as the web matured, as people started to understand, oh, we can really make money on this, and here's how. Um, that sort of the same old thing began to happen. So black folks have a foothold in an area that might be an area or an opportunity for economic advancement and uplift. Um, but as soon as uh, that sort of stronghold is there, the rules of the game change and suddenly black folks are left out. And what we have is an internet from the nineties or from the end of the nineties and on that recognizes the value of Black culture and Black cultural products, uh, but doesn't build in a way for Black people to profit from those products. And so we see the retention of Black culture that powers the internet, that powers uh, the social uh, elements of the web that we uh, talk, about, talk about that are powerful in platforms like Twitter and, and others, um, but largely Black folks are not profiting. So again, back to the question why. That's one reason, a lack of capital, the rules of the game change. But I think the bigger picture for me had to do with what was going on decades before and where this all began and back to this sense of clash between civil rights and computing. And the short answer is, um, in no uncertain terms, that to me and from the history that is found here in Black software, that com the computer revolution, the computer was not meant for us. Um, in fact, uh, uh, Adam Clayton Powell, a, uh, a former uh, congressman from Harlem, uh, had a speech that I always love to, to talk about and that's in the book where he said, you know, he's speaking about the dangers and uh, pitfalls of automation. And he said, look, we know that the uh, the Afro-American is the last hired, the first fired. And he talked about a, a number of other things and then ending up and said, we know that the new era of automation was not meant for him. And I think that, that, that statement speaks volumes about the truth of how computing and the computer revolution began with black folks not being seen as uh, people who had a stake in what would be developed in terms of this new computer re uh, revolution and a new uh, digital computing society. In fact, it was the opposite, that we were the objects, we were the problems that computers were designed to solve. And that, I think, says everything about how uh, the landscape of race and commute computing evolved and changed from the 70s, 80s, 90s, and explains why that moment when the internet was black was only a moment. Oh my gosh, I have so many questions I wanna say from this, but but I wanna, I'm, I'm required by our, our rules to tell you that we want your questions from the audience as well. And so uh, not quite yet, but just in a few minutes, uh, I'm going to turn to audience questions. So if you have questions, you can put them in uh, in the little box on uh, YouTube. And some people also submitted questions uh, in advance and we have pools of both of those questions. So, um, so the, I guess the, the thing that strikes me about your comment just now is, um, I mean, it reminds me of this sentence that I found in the book where you're talking about the 1990s and it's more of a positive 
uh, moment when you're excited uh, about the entrepreneurialism, the black entrepreneurialism, and you say black technophiles shifted the relationship that had made their parents and grandparents technology's victims. And that that echoes what you just said about um, about black populations being the object that computers act on mm -hmm. um, as opposed to act for or some some construction like that. So it, it's a very optimistic statement. And some of the questions we got before the talk started were asking you about that. Like, so is the do you see like it's possible to see if you wrote a book that if you read it, you could say. Charlton saying that Black Lives Matter is really a lot like 1965 and that there's some really interesting parallels. And, and one way you could read that is you could say it's kind of it's kind of hopeless. It never changes. It's oppression. It's inequality. You know, pe the white people keep saying, oh, my gosh, it's inequality. AI ethics. I guess we should do something about it. But other populations already knew and they always knew. So so which is it? Is it the optimistic Charlton? or the pessimistic Charlton? That's a great question. And the answer is it depends on the day. Um, and sometimes it's both. And sometimes, um, you know, I lean heavily, you know, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I lean heavily to the pessimism in part because of um, how we saw this whole thing begin in the 60s. And the hindsight of 50 years now, 50 plus years, of computing history in which um, the devastation on black people, on communities of color is so clear, so pronounced. Um, and so that is the part that keeps me uh, uh, pessimistic. And I illustrate a lot of times with uh, this sort of moment that I thought was, you know, I at least had a little chuckle uh, from a couple of years ago, I think it was, um, The Intercept had come out with this investigative report um, that was about the NYPD uh, sharing their, com or their uh, camera system across the city, uh, their, uh, com their camera surveillance data with IBM, um, for the purpose of IBM building a facial recognition system that would be able to identify criminal suspects based on skin color. And so the story was like, damn, this is happening. Um, but number two, this whole cabal between the NYPD and between IBM uh, has been going on in secret for five years. And I remember reading that at the time and thinking, man, you completely missed the boat because it wasn't a five-year story, it was a 50-year one um, in very specific terms, in terms of the relationship between the NYPD and IBM that goes back to the early uh, 60s and even before. Um, but more broadly, I thought this spoke volumes, which is to say, the more we look at our present state of computing, of surveillance uh, technology, uh, when we look at the world in which we live, the world in which Black Lives Matter emerged and continues and is sustained, um, all you can say is, you know, we've been here before. This is not new. Same questions, same impact. We have been here before, and it makes you wonder why. It makes you wonder if we have so much history, why can't we get off a different uh, get onto a different track. Um, why does it seem almost inevitable? Um, and I'm not a, you know, a technological determinist, but there is something about the way power is wielded. There is something about the way race works in the world and in the U.S. in particular that says it is a very difficult um, undertaking to try to drastically uh, uh, turn around the circumstances in which uh, computing work for us, all of us, but communities of color in particular, rather than working against or on us. As an aside, I have to say, if you work for IBM and you read this book, I'm not sure you're going to come away with a long list of things you're proud of. <laughs> that is definitely my sense. Indeed. Indeed. Um, so uh, it's time to move to questions from um, from our audience and I'm delighted with the first question because it reminded me what that third thing was I couldn't remember earlier. So earlier I said, 
it was super clarifying that Charlton you just mentioned that his argument was about um, it was about control by the state. It was about labor and automation replacing it. But it was also about education, a word that I don't think we've actually used much in the conversation, but that's a big part of the book, actually. And it's about uh, it's about black people having access to computers in order to learn. Um, but it's also about how institutions of higher education, particularly Clemson, I guess, is featured, how they work. So um, we have a question from the audience here, and it says, um, what advice do you have? Um, well, I'm going to paraphrase the question, forgive me, but it, it says, uh, do you have any advice relating to technology related departments at universities? And then and earlier it says, um, is there a way to get this history to people who have been inundated with an alternative history of computing as white? So I guess two questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great questions. And I'll, I'll try to uh, do my best to answer, you know, a, what is a, a sort of a giant um, gaping hole. And one of those is uh, sort of com uh, correcting the historical record that I think is important. Uh, that is uh, being able to get into whether they're computer scientists or whatever their flavor um, is in departments in universities, having a different story told about the history and evolution of computing technology, whether those are white students or students of color, to be able to say, look, this, uh, this evolution was not sort of neutral. Uh, it did not, uh, uh, it wasn't the beacon of democratic uh, investment that we sometimes like to think of it as. As we get to things like the internet, it was not and did not pan out to be uh, the democratic, great uh, democratic solution we thought it could be by opening up spaces for people to uh, engage and be free from uh, things like race and discrimination and so forth. And I think in large part, we repeat the problems of the past because we don't have a clear sense of what the past actually was. We delude ourselves into thinking that there was an inevitable, inevitable pathway from uh, the 1960s, let's say, and up to the present that didn't involve things like choices, very deliberate choices that people made to go in one direction versus the other. So we've got to be able to correct the record, I think, for uh, students that are part of these uh, departments, but we also have to do a much, much, much greater job in terms of representation. Um, the people who are in those departments, who are working with uh, technology, who are in STEM, um, and much of the problem as it began, began because uh, there was a lack of that representation. As people at uh, these elite uh, institutions of higher education were first developing what this new computing revolution was going to be, you looked around and you might have seen one or two Black folks. I'm talking about very literally one or two because places weren't admitting any more than that in the early 1960s or the late 1960s uh, for that matter. And so it wasn't until that sort of moment as we get through the 70s and approaching the, the 80s that we start to see some of that change that we spoke a little bit about earlier, which is gradually as black folks gain entrance into access into uh, these technical spaces uh, in engineering and computer science and so forth, that's when you're able to say, oh, now I've got access. I can take this thing and make it do what I want. I can make it uh, bend to my will and my interests. And that then was a large part of that story of the 80s and early 90s and the early internet. None of that would have been possible without that transformative um, aspect of uh, education and particularly STEM education um, at uh, the higher education level. So, so much more to be said for that, but that's at least one place to start. I have another question that's actually a great follow up to that if I'm if I just kind of squeeze it a little bit so I think uh, I think this might be from Raider 363 I'm not sure but uh, someone was was saying that they had um, a job where they worked in a university makerspace and a big part of their mission is to promote access to equipment and software uh, 
um, that's not typically available to students outside of STEM fields. Um, and I was just thinking about your answer just now about the representation piece of this. So if you had specific lessons or maybe your top lesson from this history, what steps can we take to help encourage users from diverse backgrounds? And I have, I have a suspicion of what I think you'll say based on reading the book. <laughs> well, I think there are two things. I mean, I think we have to be much more aggressive in finding and identifying these people in the kinds of ways that are reflected in a, someone like uh, Derek, who I talk about a lot in his story, is featured a lot in the book. Um, he's someone that people in college at Clemson recognized way before he arrived at Clemson when he was still a young person just being fascinated with a computer and its possibilities. And so they reached way back, even though these, uh, this was a, a kid that wasn't a current student, um, wasn't paying any tuition, uh, but they saw potential and had a, a long-term horizon that said, well, this person is in seventh grade now and has this interest, has this uh, aspiration. Why don't I go and help cultivate that then I'm in a very unique position because when it gets time in 11th grade and 12th grade to take the next step, lo and behold, I'm at the place that you need to be in to take that next educational um, journey and to advance in, uh, in engineering in this particular case. So it requires that higher education institutions have a longer view and we think about um, you know, the fact that once kids come to college, it's hard to, I mean, you're on a track already. You've decided in a large part what you want to do. Um, the first and second year, sometimes you're steered away from certain things, um, as we all know. And it's much more fruitful thinking about cultivating a sense of aspiration and possibility at a younger age that then comes into fruition later. The second part of that question is tied to this, which means people have to see some possibility, right? People don't come into a, uh, you know, a maker space or a coding camp just for the sake of being able to make something, build something, code something, right? I've gotta be able to show that there is a sense of investment later on down the road that comes from my investment in this space. And so I've gotta see a way forward if I'm either going to be an entrepreneur, let's say, or go to a Google after getting this training and uh, work for a, uh, a technology corporation and see myself being able to get from uh, a sort of ground zero starting out to a position of power. But if there is no sense about ultimately where I might end up, then there's no reason to start. And that's, I think, is the position of many folks and why we have to do a better job of saying, you do have a stake here further at the end of the road. There is economic, social, political power and capital that you can seize down here if you start here and getting certain kinds of education and training. But if that's not at the end of the road, why start down the path? I mean, it, it strikes me that you've written a, a synoptic history where the history is often told through the eyes of particular people and their stories are very vivid. And I wonder, just I guess, echoing what you were saying, if you would agree, it seems to me like these the kind of characters in the story that you highlight are there, you often, re, you're often recounting a social experience that they have as opposed to a technical one as the determining pivot. So they might like technology and they might have experiences with it that are positive, but it often seems in your narrative to come down to this idea of a conversation, a particular person that they met, or using the technology to make a social connection through the technology. So as opposed to the narratives we often hear about technology, which is like, you should come to the makerspace because of this cool thing you can build. Whereas that's not the, the sort of message I get from the book. If I'm, would you agree with my reading of it? Is that the- Yeah, yeah it, it's spot on. You know, I think of a Derek who said, you know, look, I come into this world because I learn, I love to write and code for me is an extension of writing and I want to make things beautiful. Uh, and this was my avenue to do that. And I want to make things better for people like me, communities like me. Um, you get to so many of the folks in AfroNet uh, 
um, they probably could have cared less about a lot of the technical aspects of computing. They wanted to connect with people, right? The early uh, days of the internet, the reason why all these chat rooms and, and black folks spent an enormous amount of money wasn't because they saw some technological future or sense of entrepreneurial power. Um, there was a young lady uh, on the other end uh, of the country, on the opposite end of the country that they wanted to connect to. That's what fueled their connection to doing this thing and learning what this computer was, how to, uh, uh, to network those computers, how to make things happen. And so those motives have always been, uh, at least amongst Black folks and really other uh, uh, folks of color, has it been about the technology itself? It's not a sense in which um, there's some grand uh, sort of uh, mystification that this thing, this material thing is a ticket to something. It's a tool. And the thing in itself is not my goal. It's something different, making something good, better for me, for people like me. Um, those were the things that, that powered folks. Those are the things that powered um, the internet. And it was, it's always been, you know, powerful to me and part of that uh, earlier, you know, remember when the internet was black, uh, to think about when the internet came into its own, it looked back to the Afronets of the world. They needed something that was powered by something more than just, um, you know, the, uh, the keys on a keyboard uh, or all the other material aspects of technology that you know, frankly, the world, most of the world didn't have access to or interest in. And so when they were thinking, how are we going to bring people online? How are we going to connect people to this new technology? They looked to Black folks whose connection was always about connecting, about something social, and not about um, the technology in and of itself. I mean, that's a key idea in the book as well, I think, and that's that, you know, black computing might also be thought of as a particular kind of computing. And it's it's like a, you know, you, you don't just, we're not just talking about representation, like counting the number of people of different races, something like that, but but rather what it is. Um, so we have way more questions than we'll ever get to. Um, but uh, here's one, you were just mentioning Derek. Um, is there, what's the role of black women and black LGBTQ people in you know, the history of black software when the internet was black. I mean, is there a story about them? There's a, there's a giant story and it's interesting because it doesn't come through in the book, um, but I felt it the whole time writing it. And I'll tell you where this came from. So inevitably, when you go back to that moment in the, in the 90s and you're looking at, um, uh, well, let me just go back to the 80s first. When we go to the Afronet, right? <clears throat> We find folks like an Edette Vaughn, who was the first person to say, look, um, here's this new Blackboard system uh, that we can exploit. And we can exploit to connect. We can exploit uh, for a commercial gain. And started, if you go back into uh, you know, Black Enterprise Magazine, Emerge Magazine, back at the time, they did stories on Edette Vaughn, who was the first to step out. She, I, don't, I can't even remember if she had a college education. She was a legal secretary. Um, but took this new medium and capability and said, I want to do something with it, right? Something powerful. And that story happens over and over again. The people that you see and the people that I talk to who were almost always men often started their stories with the, I started with the help of or because of, and then fill in the blank of a woman, and yet, as I started to track down some of these people, um, it was fascinating to me that I often ran into the same kind of story. So Edette Bond was one of these examples. I reach out to her, I tell her what I'm doing, I tell her who I've talked to, I tell her that you know everybody is telling me I should talk to you. And Edette Bond doesn't wanna talk. And so she writes back and we go into an exchange email <clears throat> 
Um, you know, every couple of months or so, how about this? Well, let me think about it. Um, how about this time? Well, let me talk to my other friend that you've also talked to and I'll see. Um, and then, you know, tragically, uh, just before the book comes out, Adet Vaughn uh, passed away. Um, but there was that story, that undercurrent often. Um, and Anita Brown was another one of these uh, uh, figures that does, uh, that I do talk about some in the book, um, who is one of these people that inevitably you talk to any activist, entrepreneur, educator, no matter your entry point into the tech world as a black person, all roads led to and through Anita Brown, a 50 year old black grandmother, uh, Northeast DC, um, who somehow intuitively knew that this whole tech thing was about getting people together and nothing more or that everything stemmed from that. Anita Brown, of course, uh, passes away and this is chronicled in the book um, in, uh, in the, the, the mid 2000s or so. Um, and so these stories are not coming through, but <clears throat> all of this to say, my sense of what I could intuit from the absence of many of these uh, women's voices was a sense about male dominance in the tech industry, black male dominance in the tech industry, that was a very familiar story that the men got to be visible, that they got to be the CEOs, but what was powering everything were women, but those folks did not um, get, the, get the spotlight. Um, we're, we're coming up on time, but I just, or maybe we can squeeze one in if we're really fast here. Um, a number of the questions, if I were to summarize, the number one most thing people have asked about is probably what can I do? And they want something inspirational. And Jasmine, for example, says that maybe we could take inspiration from recent examples of like new Afrofuturism, like the Black Panther, and you know, imagine a, a future, a future blackness involving computer that's different than some of the challenges you portray. I mean, what what inspires you? What can we do? Is there is there hope? Earlier you said you were pessimistic, so maybe maybe you don't have any. I don't know. I do, I do have some hope, and it comes from uh, this suggestion. It's about imagination. Think about, I always go back to Roy Wilkins, late 1960s, writes this uh, editorial that I love, I read, I've read hundreds of times now, um, Computerize the Race Question. And I'll go, I won't uh, take you all the way through it, but what he ends up at at the beginning is something that says something like, um, could we not use the computer as a measure of the Negro's lag? Could we use it instead to start to imagine a different future for Black people? And I think that is where we have to begin. We've got to be able to imagine something different. So I think that's where we start, number one. But I think number two is where we began with this smash the mainframe. I think the beauty about the folks at USB, uh, uh, UCSB uh, here at NYU that sees the, uh, the, the computer, uh, the mainframe uh, at Warren Weaver, Warren Weaver Hall because uh, they wanted $100,000 to free some Black Panthers who were arrested in New York City. Um, they understood something. They understood that here's this mechanical thing, here's this computer, and I have now taken it hostage. And you know what? I don't give a damn about what this thing is. In fact, I don't even know what it's all about because I know that there is something much more important. This question is about justice, it's about power. And so I think that as long as we keep our sights on how do we ensure getting more justice how can we gain more power? That is the question so much uh, more than where we often lead, which is how can we make our tech better? How can we make our code a little bit less biased? I think those are important questions, but we have to keep our eyes on the prize as these uh, brave uh, uh, black folks did back in the 60s. We have got to seize power. We've got to understand where power lies and how we uh, relieve 
those who typically wield it of it so that we can do things uh, that are much more in our interests and that bring about uh, justice. Well, what a great conversation this has been. Thank you so much for it. It's a privilege. I want to encourage everyone to immediately buy the book that is visible over Charlton's right shoulder. That is the cover of the book that we've been talking about. I also want to say, I mean, if you like this and you want more stuff like this, then it's at si.umich.edu or, uh, or and um, escape or esc.umich.edu or follow us on social media. We've got, you know, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we've got it all. And um, we'll have more fantastic talks, although perhaps not as good as this conversation because uh, it was fantastic. So um, I'm sure if the audience were all present and not under lockdown somewhere, they would be roaring with applause to thank you for this uh, this time that you've spent with us. So, but let me thank you. I will take it and th thank you as well. I wish we had a couple more hours. There's so much more we could go into, but thank you, Christian. Thanks to uh, University of Michigan. Thanks to everybody that tuned in tonight. All right, en enjoy your weather. Uh, I'll do my best. <laughs>